on Tuesday. For many, it's a good evening. For many, it's a good afternoon. And for all the speakers today, it's a good morning. Um, I'm really pleased that we have um, with us today um, two excellent speakers from Sefiet. Um, Deva Senak, Nana Shamugam. She is a um, Senior Director of Medical Affairs at Sefiet and um, is in charge of the portfolio of TB, HIV and um, hepatitis. She's a physician um, with a specialization in pediatrics and has worked for many years in NIH. And she's going to talk to us today um, to talk about the background of the TB activities that Sefiet is, um, is doing. And she'll give an, a presentation. We also have with us uh, Michael Lovell Holtz, who is also a senior director of medical affairs at Sefiet. And he's also an adjunct professor at, of, path of pathology at the University of Texas. He has had many leadership positions in uh, public health laboratories and private reference labs in the past, and he's gonna to talk to us today also about um, gene expert, experts, the technology um, of Cepheid, and um, we're really, really pleased that both of you are um, with us and uh, going to present today. This is a subject um, of high interest for many people in the community, um, in the tuberculosis community, and it's very, very timely. Um, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Madhupai to give a short introduction in a more general sense, setting the scene on the diagnostics and then leading into the more specifics on the gene experts and how we can leverage gene experts for both for tuberculosis and COVID testing. Madhu, do you want to start? Thank you, Petra. Um, thanks everyone for joining us in this uh, TBPPM Learning Network webinar. Um, almost a month ago, uh, we and many others uh, raised a lot of alarm and concern that the COVID pandemic is going to devastate TB care services in many countries. And sadly, uh, all the news reports that are now coming in from various countries confirm um, what we had discussed. TB services are getting disrupted and really badly disrupted. Um, some big trends that we're already seeing in many countries is a, is a big, big drop in TB uh, case notifications because of lockdown and other anxieties, patients are simply not seeking care. And even when they do seek care, um, private providers, for example, are anxious about managing people with cough and fever. Um, so we have um, already um, some data that TB diagnosis is being significantly disrupted in many uh, countries, and that includes drug susceptibility testing. So new cases of MDR, TB are probably not getting picked up in many settings. There's also uh, data that uh, TB services and infrastructure uh, is being redirected towards dealing with COVID. Uh, TB wards are being converted into COVID wards and laboratories are being taken over for COVID testing. Now, COVID itself, we know, is now about to hit the 2.5 million mark globally. And unlike, say, a month ago, we are now starting to see a, a dramatic escalation in uh, incidence of COVID in low and middle income countries. So within the last few weeks, we are seeing big increases um, in countries like India, Russia, Brazil, Peru, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and we know China was already affected at the start of the epidemic, which means there's gonna be a big overlap in countries which are dealing with TB, as well as countries that are currently suffering from uh, uh, COVID-19. And we also know that testing for COVID is absolutely fundamental as part of the pandemic response. Countries that do not test uh, um, for COVID will not see much COVID, not because COVID is not there, because they're simply not looking. And there's a very nice correlation between per capita GDP and rates of COVID testing. By and large, poorer countries are doing poorly on COVID testing. So when Cepheid announced that they have a new express SARS-CoV cartridge, there was great excitement in our field of TB um, and a and, uh, lot of interest in this product, which is why we in, we've invited colleagues from Cepheid to give this webinar, not because we promote products on this webinar, we don't do that, but for us to learn what the technical issues are around this SARS-CoV cartridge, to learn a little bit more about how it integrates into the existing TB gene expert testing platforms, and also for us to raise some of our anxieties. For example, 
Um, the, the good news about the, the Cepheid cartridge is the fact that uh, low and middle income countries have 10 years of experience in using the GeneXpert platform. 45 million cartridges have been used in high TB burden countries. 45,000 plus modules now exist around the world and it's already being used for HIV, hepatitis C, Ebola, and so on and so forth. So this is a product that many poor resource countries are very familiar with. They have it, they're comfortable with it, it's easy to use. So they're all asking, okay, maybe this is the easiest way for us to start uh, increasing our COVID testing capacity. So that's the uh, nice part about this story that we, uh, we must keep in mind. Um, now, the question is, the anxieties, which we will discuss in greater detail in the question answer session is, first of all, will, will low income countries even be able to buy enough SARS-CoV cartridges? Uh, what would it cost them? Can they run both TB and SARS-CoV at the same time? What are the biosafety issues involved in running both? Um, and there's also anxieties that if countries switched to running SARS-CoV on the gene expert, they will drop the ball on MTB RIF testing, which we know is quite critical in many countries. So there is this anxiety of displacement of TB diagnostic services by SARS-CoV. And then there is also an anxiety that uh, we may struggle with even procuring MTB RIF cartridges in future because everybody is so um, anxious to get enough SARS-CoV cartridges go going. So these are some of the, um, the, the, the excitement around it, but also legitimate anxieties about it. So we'll start off uh, with our two uh, colleagues from Safiyad, and then we will dive straight into the Q&A session. Thank you so much, uh, Devasena and Michael. Thank you, uh, Madhu, for that introduction. So um, I'm assuming that you can see my screen here? Yes. Okay, great. And so with that, um, I will just give a very brief overview on the expert MTB testing that is currently available or expected in the very near future. Um, much of this material is likely to be very familiar to several people who are on the line. Um, so I won't spend a great deal of time and focus uh, more on the COVID test and then the questions at the end. So as you all know, there are several different um, um, instruments that can be used for gene expert testing, and several of them are shown here, including the Infinity, which is uh, usually used in central labs. But as you can see, depending on your need, you can use the instrument um, and the modules depending on your capacity and your volume. And as you also are probably aware, once the instrument is purchased, the, the differences in the test that you conduct are going to be based on then the cartridges that you use. So in other words, once the instrument, instrument is procured, your testing can vary um, based on different disease entities and on the different uh, tests that you require in your certain uh, area. So this is an overview of the current uh, TB products that are available and are in development. Many of you are familiar with the MTB RIF Ultra test. Um, as well as the previous, what we call the G4 test shown here. Um, and then I will briefly touch upon the MTB XDR cartridge that's also in development. So this is probably a slide that you all are familiar with that just gives you a general overview on how sampling um, is, is uh, processed, inserted into the machine fairly quickly, you then obtain a result. And this is expected to be uh, the same with the other TB products and very similar to other products and other tests that we have in um, at Cepheid and with the GeneXpert platform. So coming then to the ultra test, um, here is a table that de demonstrates the differences between the MTB RIF cartridge and the Ultra cartridge. And as you all um, probably are well aware of at this time, the TB detection target is different from these two uh, tests. Specifically, the Ultra, target, Ultra cartridge targets the insertion sequences that are listed here. Those are the targets that are of interest if you are looking for um, detection of the organism. We still use the RPOB gene region in order to determine rifampin resistance, and that's shown here. And as you all know, uh, the variability here with semi-quantification is the addition of the trace result. 
And um, just again, to refresh your memory, the trace result occurs when the insertion sequence is detected, but insufficient information is provided or available regarding the RPOB gene targets. So as you all are now aware, once you have a trace result, you cannot have any conclusive information on the rifampin resistance. So the intended use of the ultra target is, or the ultra cartridge is uh, shown here specifically that again, you can use unprocessed sputum samples or concentrated samples. Uh, the, in, the use is not for those who have already been receiving therapy and we, we are using this cartridge or on label, it is for the diagnosis specifically for pulmonary TB and specifically using sputa samples. So those are the samples that are considered on label use with this test. Um, we also, again, hope um, and expect that when you have results from this test that they will be interpreted in conjunction with other clinical and laboratory findings. And after the ultra test has been released, we have noted that this has been very critical specifically in order to determine the trace results that people are getting. So as you also probably know, um, the volume in the two tubes is different, and this also is um, helpful in increasing the sensitivity for this test. So there is a faster time to result here, um, and we hope that that, will, that has assisted in improving treatment initiation. The other piece of the, um, testing, the testing mechanism is that it increases um, specificity for rifampin resistance testing because it does include um, the interpretation of the silent mutations more accurately. Um, and we also know that it has also increased in its sensitivity compared to the previous version of the MTB RIF test. So this is an overview of some of the clinical performance that has been noted after the release of the test. And I think what is um, most instructive here is when you see this graph here where um, you look at the delta in sensitivity across the different uh, types and groups of patients. So very specifically, we do see an increase in sensitivity here um, across all patients, but also notably, we see an increase in sensitivity, oops, apologies, um, with the specifically the smear negative patients and those who are HIV positive. And these were very much of interest um, when the test was developed to increase sensitivity and to be able to identify TB in these um, populations in which it has uh, historically been very difficult to diagnose TB. So briefly, I'll provide an overview on the XDR TB cartridge that's in development. Um, and we are hopeful that this still will be aligned with the MTB treatment guidelines as has been issued by the WHO. In other words, we do hope that the data that are obtained from use of the XDR TB cartridge still allows for effective and fully oral uh, treatment regimens. It also is going to be um, providing information on fluoroquinolone resistance as well as a second line injectable resistance and the need for close monitoring for patient safety will continue. So although there are new drugs that are currently available, namely bedaquilin and delaminid, that will not be included um, uh, in this XDR TB cartridge, we are still um, very optimistic that this cartridge will still be aligned with the current practices and that it will continue to be useful as clinicians are creating regimens for pre-XDR and XDR TB. So um, these are data that were taken from uh, uh, an early publication on this product. So as you all know, most resistance to the major TB drugs is associated with about 25 mutations. Um, and this product will use um, 10 fluorocore and quencher pairs combined. So it will be able to distinguish the wild type sequence from about 32 mut mutant sequences. So what I'm showing you also here are the um, temperature melt profiles and they're quite complicated, but as you all are probably already aware, considering use of the ultra, this is also going to be the mechanism by which resistance is detected in the XDR TB cartridge. In other words, a shift between what we consider to be the temperature melt profile for the wild type will be noted in those um, temperature melt panels and profiles for those organisms that demonstrate mutant, uh, mutant genes for the respective uh, drugs. 
So this is um, an overview of what are the drugs and the gene mutations that will be detected. Isoniazid will be included, uh, as will a detection of ethionamide, considering that the gene is very similar uh, to the isoniazid, isoniazid gene mutation that is of interest. Fluoroquinolone resistance will also be detected, as will the um, second-line injectable agents. So this is a pre-launch brochure that is available, um, and if those are interested, we can um, connect you with our commercial group to be able to provide you with a bit more information on the products that are currently available and that will be coming out soon. And then lastly, I'll just touch upon the Omni. Um, as you can see, there isn't a great deal of information on this slide. Um, and what is provided here is likely information that you all know, but it is going to be battery operated. We expect it to be far more robust to um, issues of dust and high temperature. There will be a mobile phone interface and connectivity will also be included in this device. The controlled studies are currently underway and we hope to have more information on this product and how those studies look in the very near future. So with that, I will turn it over to Mike Luffelholtz who will talk more in detail about our COVID uh, ID test. Right. Okay. Well, hello, and it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, these are my disclosures. And um, just like to start with describing the, the culprit behind the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the virus that, that causes COVID-19 has been named the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2 or uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this virus is um, part of the, or will be assigned to, uh, to the genus beta coronavirus, subgenus Sarbico, uh virus. This also includes the SARS uh, uh, virus that was responsible for the uh, epidemic of 2003, but since, uh, since 2003 has not been present in the human population. Um, coronaviruses are, are zoonotic viruses. All, all of these at one point in time had a, uh, uh, have or have had an animal origin. The uh, COVID-19 outbreak uh, began in, in December of 2019 and uh, first case reported in Wuhan, China. Um, it's important to note that there are other coronaviruses that are very common in the human population. Uh, NL63, 229E, HKU1, OC43 are, are four uh, species that are human adapted and have existed in, in humans and, and are very frequent causes of upper respiratory symptoms. Uh, these have existed um, for hundreds of years in the human population. They're primarily winter um, um, uh, peak seasonality. These do not uh, cross-react with tests that are designed to detect SARS-CoV-2. Uh, they're, they're distinct enough. And so this dendrogram here just shows the different uh, a genera in, in the uh, coronaviridae family. The, uh, we, we've got alpha, beta, gamma, delta uh, uh, genera. The, these, uh, the, the, the blue um, um, areas here depict the beta coronaviruses and included in among the beta coronaviruses is the B lineage, which in uh, includes the SARS-CoV-2 as well as the original SARS virus. Uh, if we look more closely at that particular clade, you see a number of viruses here that are very closely related. The, the SARS-CoV-2 or the Wuhan strain is in red and very closely related to that are some other bat and animal associated 
coronaviruses. And this is why some of the targets for molecular tests will detect not only the, um, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but some other closely related viruses. And this is just an update as to the, the, the uh, or a very recent update as of a couple days ago to the, uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, well over uh, 2 million confirmed cases. I think that that means that there's probably somewhere between 20 and 200 million actual cases worldwide uh, and, and over 150,000 reported deaths. Uh, if there's any good news in all of this, you'll see in, in the curve here um, at the lower right hand that, that, that maybe the curve is flattening as a result of, of some of the, the prevention measures that have, have been undertaken. So for the laboratory diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2, nucleic acid amplification tests or NATs are are considered the gold standard, and I'll get more into those in a minute. Um, there's also been a lot of interest in serologic tests and the role that they can play in identifying individuals with immunity. Uh, the, the major immunogenic proteins of the SARS-CoV-2 virus are the N or nucleocapsid and S or spike proteins. So some of these ELISAs under, the de under development are, um, are utilizing these proteins, uh, often recombinant proteins. Um, but it's important that serologic tests sh cannot be used solely um, to, to reliably diagnose acute cases of COVID-19 because antibodies are not reliably detected until about 10 days after the onset of symptoms. Um, in addition, there, are, there is the potential, I should say, for rapid antigen detection tests. You know, in general, these tests are, are fast and, and relatively inexpensive. They've been used for detection of other respiratory viruses, uh, most um, um, commonly for the detection of influenza and, and respiratory syncytial virus in respiratory samples. Um, however, they're, they're, they are not as sensitive as nucleic acid amplification tests. The, these rapid flu tests are upwards of a thousand times less sensitive than, than PCR tests. And, um, and, and so while some, some prototype antigen detection tests have been described for SARS-CoV-2, it remains to be proven how, uh, um, how clinically sensitive they are. So, as I said, nucleic acid amplification tests are the, the gold standard for detection of SARS-CoV-2. They, uh, they, they provide the sensitive detection of the viral RNA in upper respiratory tract specimens for uh, um, consistently and usually about one week after the onset of symptoms. Um, um, beyond a week, uh, when, when viral shedding begins to taper off, the sensitivity decreases. Uh, in individuals who have lower respiratory tract disease, like pneumonia, uh, the specimens from the lower respiratory tract, like such as sputum, can remain positive for RNA longer. All right, this slide here just shows some of the specimen collection guides from, from the uh, CDC, the US CDC and the WHO. And uh, they, they both describe the, or include the use of nasopharyngeal swabs, oral pharyngeal swabs, nasal washes and aspirates from, from the upper respiratory tract as, as suitable specimens for, for testing for SARS-CoV-2 RNA. Um, in addition, they describe lower respiratory tract specimens, including BAL and uh, sputum, uh, tracheal aspirates is, is another source. Uh, in addition, uh, the, the WHO also includes uh, non-respiratory sources such as stool 
uh, for the purpose perhaps of monitoring shedding of the virus, uh, but not, uh, not really for uh, diagnostic purposes. All right, so this is the, the, the Cepheid Expert Express SARS-CoV-2 test. It looks just like the, 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 the MTB in our other products, the same, the same general cartridge uh, format. Uh, On-label specimen types are nasopharyngeal, nasal, and mid-turbinate swabs collected in viral transport medium and then also nasal washes and aspirates. Uh, although these are the, the nasal washes and aspirates involve a, an additional off-board processing step. So they're not uh, on label for, for some of our point of care uh, uh, instrument systems like the Express tablet or, or hub. Uh, so in the design of the SARS-CoV-2 test, we leveraged our current Express Flu RSV cartridge and much of what's inside of this cartridge is identical between the two tests with the exception of course of the primers and probes and this allowed us to really rapidly develop this test in in only eight weeks time and to get um, authorization from the u.s fda uh, sample processing is very simple straightforward 300 microliters of sample is pipetted into the cartridge that's the single step uh, using pipettes that are provided in the kit. And um, because of this, this uh, simple step like this, uh, organizations like WHO and CDC, uh, you know, do not uh, absolutely require that this be done inside of a biological safety cabinet. It's definitely not BSL-3 because we're not cultivating the virus, we're not uh, doing extensive manipulation of the specimens. A single addition of 300 microliters into the cartridge. Once the cartridge is closed and put into the instrument, the runtime is approximately 45 minutes. And this, this test can be performed on the Gene Expert, Gene Expert Express, Infinity instruments. And I think that's one of the questions that was, was, was raised. It can be performed um, in modules alongside the, uh, the, the MTB and other tests. So the targets in the, the Cepheid Expert Express SARS-CoV-2 assay are the N2 for the text and nucleocapsid gene and the E for the uh, uh, glyc membrane glycoprotein envelope. If the N2 alone is detected, it will report positive. If both N2 and E are detected, it also reports positive. If E alone is detected, the test will report presumptive positive. And this is because the E target is shared with other viruses in that that beta coronavirus, bat-like uh, coronavirus clade that I was showing earlier that are very related. <clears throat> of course, these other, these other viruses like the, the SARS uh, coronavirus from 2003 and other uh, bat SARS-like coronaviruses are currently not present in the human population. So for all practical purposes, if, if the test is positive with, by only the E target, then our, it, it reports presumptive positive, but, it's, but we consider it uh, um, just as definitive. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> early performance data uh, were, uh, were, were generated with contrived specimens that were spiked with, with live virus all the way uh, down to, to just two, two times the limit of detection, and we had 100% agreement with expected results. Our claimed limit of detection is 250 copies per milliliter or 0 0.01 plaque forming units per mil. This is a, a limit of detection that is, is among the best in the, in the field among all commercial um, FDA uh, authorized tests for, uh, for SARS-CoV-2. <clears throat> and then lastly, uh, published peer-reviewed studies are just starting to come out now on, on the performance of these commercial tests for, for SARS-CoV-2. 
and this is the first uh, paper. It's a brief study, uh, look comparing head to head the the Cepheid Expert Express assay against the Roche assay, uh, the Cobos uh, assay performed on their large instrument, the 6800. These investigators looked at um, 203 specimens, mostly nasal pharyngeal swabs, and found uh, agreement in all specimens except one. So an overall agreement of 99%. Uh, uh, 42 specimens were positive with both tests, 60 were negative with both tests, and there was finally one specimen that was positive by expert and negative by Cobos, and this was a very weak, a very weak pos uh, um, specimen, probably with a, a low viral load right near the, the limit of detection. So I know that more studies are are in press and and we'll be seeing more more peer-reviewed literature coming out uh, very soon and i thank you for your attention and i think we'll hand it over uh to the moderators for um for, for q a now thank you um michael and davisena that was very helpful so lots of questions through the chat as well as questions that we have received even in our previous webinars I'll try and break them up into two big buckets. One is the technical issues around the new SARS-CoV and integration, biosafety, all of those issues. And the second set of questions is more to do with access to low and middle income countries, procurement and stuff like that. So from a technical point of view, uh, Michael, um, what is the limit of detection for the SARS-CoV cartridge and how does it compare to the other RT-PCR uh, COVID assays that are being used now? Yeah, so, so we claim both 250 copies per mil or 0 0.01 platforming units. Uh, other commercial tests, uh, the, the, <clears throat> the best that I have seen is, a, again, about 0 0.01 platforming units <clears throat> among a couple of the other large batch based systems some of the other tests are uh, much uh, have, have much uh, that's a good way of saying it worse limit of detection um, so so this this uh, analytical sensitivity is is among the best among the, the commercial tests uh-huh okay um, the other question uh, that quite a few people have asked is, is there any plan for an integrated TB and a SARS-CoV cartridge in one single cartridge, or is that simply not technically or biologically sensible? No, no plans to do that at this time. And in any case, the sample is vastly different, right? So well, it would be a challenge to, to pull off both in the same cartridge, given the difference in samples. Yes, yeah, sputum is not on label for the SARS-CoV-2 test. I, it is a specimen source that is among those listed by the US uh, FDA, CDC, and WHO. Uh, I believe that some customers are using this sample for the SARS-CoV-2 test off-label. Uh, we have done some studies with a very similar sample, a tracheal aspirate, which some people consider almost to be a sputum sample. And you know, it, it, um, it, it shows real viability in, in the test. I, I think that it can be uh, uh, clinically useful. But of course, there are different pretreatment processes of specimens for these two different tests that have to be taken into account. And also we know from um, symptom um, and disease course evolution that um, COVID is more an acute fever with cough. Well, TB, we typically wait for two to three weeks of cough before we start worrying about TB. So it seems that if you did a TB test too early, like after one week of cough or three, four days of cough, the sensitivity of TB will probably be very low. So that may be another reason not to force these two syndromes together because we simply are not comparing them in the same uh, time course in terms of biology. Does that make sense? 
That makes yeah, sense. I think that's and, a, yeah, yeah, David Sena, I was going to suggest that maybe you add into that. Go ahead. Yeah, Davis. I think, thank you. Um, yeah, I think that's absolutely right, Madhu. I think that that's something we all need to be, um, you know, cognizant of and mindful of as, as much as we certainly want to continue um, with the TB testing. Um, I think as you have stated, and I think the current literature is also supporting that is to, again, be paying attention to the clinical presentation of the patients um, and being very mindful of what is likely to be the case. So as you very rightfully stated, we expect that again, TB is going to be a disease for which people are likely to have been suffering from symptoms for at least a minimum of a few weeks. And um, again, you know, we, we certainly want to make sure that optimal testing is, is performed for all patients who are suffering with respiratory illness, but just to, again, keep that clinical presentation in mind. And also the fact that um, COVID predominantly presents as a dry cough um, and, 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 um, and a sore throat while TB as we wait longer becomes more a wet cough that is productive and produces sputum. So even just in terms of the ability to collect a sample together seems challenging uh, to me because one really is not designed for uh, expectoration than the other one we actually expect sputum to be a, a, an important component of the syndrome. Yes, that's absolutely right. I think that um, the data so far have shown that may, many patients don't present at least initially with a productive cough with, uh, with COVID-19. Okay, good. That was very helpful because yes. a lot of people are trying to see if they can somehow squeeze both testing together, which seems challenging both, uh, you know, in terms of its biology as well as the sample type being different. Now, biosafety seems like a huge issue for a lot of people, right? So if you look at the existing gene expert modules that have been procured in high burden countries with TB, um, they are at least at the sub-district or the district level. Very few have successfully been performed at the primary health care level. Um, but many of them are not necessarily done in even biosafety level two, let alone three, right? So is the existing location where gene experts are being currently used for TB good enough to also do a SARS-CoV cartridge in the same lab setting that they're working in, let's say a district or a sub-district level, or do they need to take the instrument and move it to a whole another a different biosafety level setting to pull off SARS-CoV? Maybe I can yeah, so actually go, I was gonna go ahead and just um, make a few comments and then def um, and hand it over to you, Mike. Um, since this is very related to the settings in which people are conducting TB testing. Um, so, as you are probably aware, initially the expectation was that these any type of specimen handling and specimen manipulation should be conducted in um, BSL-2 settings and likely within a biosafety cabinet. However, as you also may be aware, CDC has now also um, listed guidelines for appropriate point of care testing. And this allows for this, uh, this opens up language in which the testing can be performed in a point of care setting. So when I look at those data and I look at the language there, I think the most important thing to understand is that we want to ensure that the person who is collecting that specimen has appropriate um, personal protective equipment, which is easy to say in a webinar like this, um, because we know that there is a shortage of all of this that's happening uh, within the United States, within countries that have many resources, and we only expect that, unfortunately, that will be exacerbated in other countries that don't have as many resources. But I think the point here is that we expect that the highest risk of um, a biosafety issue is at the time of specimen collection. So in other words, um, as, you, as I stated earlier, there is currently now language that essentially implies it will likely be safe to transport the specimen into the cartridge uh, under conditions that don't require a biosafety cabinet or don't require BSL-2. So considering that, that we use the TB cartridge, for example, in microscopy centers and that it is allowed, uh, it's, it, it is um, acceptable to conduct TB testing with the gene expert in such settings, this testing is also very likely to be compatible with those settings. So apologies to interrupt you, Mike, but um, 
please please add on if you um, if you if you have more to say. Yes, this is a quite a critical question. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, yeah, that's um, very very well stated and, and thorough. Uh, just to add, we we do have uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration authorization with this test to to be performed at the point of care in a non laboratory setting by non laboratory. Uh, professionals, uh, and again, because the, the procedurally it, it it's it's so easy to perform, and you know the the the, the risks are uh, also relatively you know uh, mitigated. So, um, so so that in some ways that's good news because most low and middle income countries probably will not have biosafety cabinets or BSL-2 labs. Um, but let's go back to the, the issue that Davison has said. It's less about the pipetting of the sample into the cartridge and running it uh, wherever the gene expert is. The risk is more when somebody is actually collecting the sample for SARS-CoV testing. Um, so Davison, at a minimum, paint me a picture what should the sample collector be wearing or having? So they should have a wearing a glove. Would a face shield be necessary or would an N95 respirator be adequate or a surgical mask be adequate? What is the minimum protection that the sample collector um, for SARS-CoV need to be wearing? So ideally, you really want the gown, the gloves, minimally a surgical mask. Um, again, this is really considering that you're cons you're assuming uh, contact precautions in such a setting. If you expect aerosolization, an N95 respirator would be better. Um, so that th those would be my recommendations. The CDC has also issued that um, there could be instances, and if possible, to actually have a face shield, so something that truly does protect you from any type of aerosolization that's occurring, if that's possible, by all means. But I think the key piece here is that you really you you want to be um, providing uh, people with as much personal protective equipment as you can, and that may mitigate your need for a biosafety cabinet and a BSL-2 um, setting. It quite, it, it does make sense that when you take a nasal swab, for example, somebody might sneeze, not because they want to, but because it irritates them, or they could cough or sneeze and therefore the risk is high. But let's say the sample reaches a laboratory. Paint me a picture of what you want the lab technician who's currently running the TB RIF cartridge what should that person be wearing uh, to be able to pull off a test wherever they're currently running the TB assay? Right, so similarly, because, so we, we're assuming then that the person who has collected the sample may be very different from the person who's actually running the sample. Typically, yes. I, Yes. So in those situations, I still think that what is going to be important is still some type of personal protective equipment again, because again, what you're trying to what you're trying to do is protect yourself from the event of aerosolization that may occur during specimen manipulation. Again, we think that that's going to be a very minimal risk. Um, considering that we, we really want is for you to be taking a, a liquid sample and placing it into the cartridge. Mike, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I know that the standard in, in the United States is for, for individuals working with these specimens and, and running this test is, is, you know, the usual PPE gloves, uh, a mask and, and lab coat. And then during that, during the, the, the step in which 300 microliters of the sample is added to the cartridge, to, to, to do that in a biosafety cabinet, if a biosafety cabinet's available, but it's not required, uh, and if it's not available, to, to have a shield uh, between the user and the specimen, uh, either a face shield or a, a bench top shield. Okay, so, um, and just to be clear again, you would not currently recommend using sputum samples to run the SARS-CoV uh, assay, correct? No, it's 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 off label. It's, it's off, off label, and okay. and right, and so individuals would would have to, you know, adhere to their their local government, uh, you know, uh, guidelines rules for, uh, you know, for for running off label specimens. Okay, 
Now, in terms of um, the, you have an FDA emergency approval for the SARS-CoV. Um, do you have any plans to get some kind of a WHO emergency use uh, listing or something that will allow other countries that don't necessarily rely on FDA? Yes. Yeah, there is. Uh, we are working uh, as I speak on, on the uh, WHO pre-qualification. We are uh, also going very shortly to, to the CEIVD marking. Okay. And these are expected in the coming weeks, months? Do you have any timelines? Uh, uh, days to weeks. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about access. So currently, let's say India, or South Africa, Nigeria, or Zimbabwe want to procure the SARS-CoV cartridge. Is the global drug facility the, the right uh, portal for them? Or should they contact national distributors or local distributors? I know you have regional and national distributors for your TB test. Who, who is the right uh, person for them to contact? And does the GDF pricing only apply for uh, public sector, like your HBDC TB pricing? Or is it open for anyone, including say private laboratories uh, in India or Nigeria to procure them? Um, so we do expect that um, the GDF will be one procurement agency for accessing the uh, COVID testing. Other procurement agents may also be available such as UNICEF and others. So we're working on um, through those channels as well. In some countries, distributors may also be um, the source for people to access the cartridge. Regarding the pricing, um, what I can tell you is that the HBD pr HBDC pricing is about $20, as you know. Um, I, I can't tell you definitively if that will change based on whether you're in the private sector within your country or not. So I will have to get back to you about that information for sure. But what we can say is that the HBD market pricing is at that around 20 and uh, I know GDF um, has its own uh, internal regulations on whether they will sell to private sector or not, because then they are anxious that that will then be something where the final price will not be something that they can assure uh, the system. The second issue is um, one of the questions that we kept getting a lot is that we know, for example, US itself is struggling with uh, SARS-CoV testing, right? A lot of testing is needed. And everybody knows that Safir is an American company. So legitimately the question that is being asked is that will low income countries even get a shot at procuring your assay? Will your production be good enough to supply your national needs? I mean, we all acknowledge that you have to help your own country in a crisis. So that's not uh, anyone uh, would dispute. So you will need to be useful and relevant to the US, which is really uh, struggling right now. But low income countries really want it because they have the existing gene expert modules. And this is a much easier test for them to do than uh, other RT PCR assays. So tell us a little bit about how you're thinking in terms of equitable supply to low income countries that might want your SARS CoV test. So I think that when, you know, Oh, go ahead, Mike. Uh, 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 just, just sort of a, a broad statement that we we've ra uh, we we are now manufacturing from our Solna or Stockholm, Sweden facility. So, so we're manufacturing at, at at full capacity in the U.S. and we're manufacturing at full capacity in Sweden. And this is really to uh, to to ensure access worldwide. We've we've initiated some 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 sort of you know validation pre-qualification with a number of different uh, countries around the world uh, who have who have used the, the the validation data to essentially kick off the testing in in these countries so so you were saying you've really stepped up the production and you're confident that you can meet national and international demand uh, well you know the, the uh, the good, the good and the bad is that there's so much interest and, and demand for this test. I think pe people see the value of the random access 
the, the fast turnaround time and, and the impact that it can have. So our challenge now is to meet that interest and demand. So I'll just add to that to say that, you know, um, within Cepheid, we're very well aware of the number of instruments that are placed globally and very specifically in low and middle income countries. Um, and we, we're also um, very, very cognizant that given the number of instruments that are in place, this test when made available will probably be one of the tests that is more most accessible to low and middle income countries. So as you can see, if there's, we've already gotten an interest in applying for a WHO prequal. Um, so the plans are very much in motion um, to allow as many people as possible to be able to use this test globally. So it's very much at the very forefront of the thinking and it's the current plan is not to be USA exclusive. Okay, and there is no explicit ban against exporting from US. Uh, you know, some countries not have done all... <laughs> Go ahead, David. Not, not, yeah, I was going to say, not to my knowledge. Um, as you know, the government um, changes Most very quickly. rapidly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yesterday immigration was uh, 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 likely to be banned, so anything can happen. We, we hear you. Um, let's then talk a little bit more through that. So you're really stepping up your production capacity and you're manufacturing in US and your European sites. Um, is there any risk because we we coming from the TB world and we are very anxious that uh, a, an over emphasis of COVID might come at the cost of TB, right? And that's a very legitimate concern that we all have and we are constantly talking about it. Is there any risk that your MTB RIF production will suffer because you are putting all your production lines or your robotic lines onto SARS-CoV? What reassurance can we get from Cepheid that you will not drop the ball on your MTB RIF uh, product? So I can tell you that this is also something that's being currently um, evaluated very closely. And at the moment, we have no plans of withholding or reducing production with that. However, I can also say for those who are um, listening in is to be, we, we hope that you also won't begin to um, stockpile and to begin to order cartridges in excess of what you may need, considering that this may be something that could happen. So we strongly encourage that you still be very cognizant of the inventory that you require now and, and, and expect your projections and please do that accurately so that we are able to get the cartridges to the people who need them. We, you know, the last thing we would want are for cartridges to be expired that were um, that didn't get used. Um, really valid point, and I hope um, you will take this internally within Safiad leadership. And I'm happy to also uh, write to uh, Warren and David about this. That we we totally agree with you that countries should not be stockpiling MTB RIF worrying about potential stockouts. At the same time, it'll be nice for your company to reassure the TB community that you are on top of this and that you will not deprioritize MTB RIF because it is one of your best uh, products in terms of its ability to save lives and the global health visibility and goodwill that it has brought to your company. So it would be pretty tragic if, if that suffered uh, because of um, SARS-CoV taking over all your energy and, and your production lines. Um, in terms of uh, the um, $20 price, um, is that only for the public sector within countries or do you see, uh, in other words, does somebody need to show to you that they are buying it as a national TV program or does it not matter? Could it be anyone in the government procuring? Uh, have you figured out uh, what the issues are? I know GDF is no, seen as a TB agency, right? It's a TB specific agency, but it is not necessary that countries will necessarily use the TB mechanisms to procure. Uh, any health ministry can directly procure or want to procure COVID testing. So can you tell us a little bit about how you see who is eligible and who can buy? So I, 
my sense in all of this and currently current discussions are very likely that this will be driven to a certain extent by the TB community within the different countries because again that's generally where the instruments are being placed so it makes a lot of sense that that would be channeled in that manner but your point is well taken that obviously it doesn't need to exclusively come from the TB community or GDF and so my again we are this is under discussion but you generally speaking before the HBDC countries this is likely going to be the price um, regardless of where the invoicing uh, and and where the um, the request is coming from and uh, another question uh, that we keep getting is you know high burden TB countries are not the same uh, India could afford something South Africa could afford something but that doesn't mean uh, a really low income country can potentially afford the $20 price tag. Is there any thinking about uh, 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 tiered pricing even within this for the lowest income countries, which probably don't have any other reasonable way to access SARS-CoV testing at this point? I think at the moment, the answer is no. Um, we have, but I can also say that, as you know, this is early days into implementing the test in the various countries and as more data come in this may be subject to change so i i also can say that being in um, this division within cepheid we're we're not as well linked with the commercial side but i will take your question up with the commercial side as well okay and um, so um, in terms of uh, do you see any WHO recommendation coming out on the SARS-CoV and TB together, or is that still uh, as part of your uh, pre-qualification and whatever processes you might have to do at this point in time? Yeah, to, uh, recommendations regarding pricing or no, no, guidelines testing? Or? On guidelines for some kind of a guideline for use in low and middle income countries. Uh, right now, you know, many LMICs depend on WHO recommendations or some kind of a WHO uh, policy note. Uh, is there any plans to put out such a policy note? So I know that the WHO has already come out with frequently asked questions um, and that's available on their website. Considering some of the issues around personal protective equipment, I think some questions were also raised very specifically about co-testing. So con doing joint testing for both COVID as COVID-19, as well as TB. What is also being done is FIND is evaluating the tests as well, and we expect them to come out with the recommendations relatively soon. We're also in touch with WHO fairly regularly to, to um, answer and, uh, and assist in any questions that they have. So we've made um, a suggestion to them that they provide specific guidance. Um, and so we will also be in touch with them to help them with any questions that they have with, and we hope that there will be specific guidance around this. Cool. Excellent. Um, Petra, um, do you have uh, questions that our national TV program managers have sent um, that we could ask our uh, Safiyat colleagues to talk about? I think you've, you've covered many of them. Um, and I'm hesitant to, to weed through in the last two minutes um, to weed through many of those questions because I see we have about 100 questions, over 100 questions. So um, I think you've covered most of the main points. Um, I would suggest that um, if people have questions that have not been answered, please get uh, back to us on our website and we will, we will try and field some specific questions with different, either with uh, our colleagues in Cepheid or uh, we will look for um, other sources that can help us answer these questions. Um, and one, one other uh, question for you, Devasena, is uh, do you have any more information on the timelines of your XDR cartridge when can the TB community realistically expect to, to um, have them for clinical use? Yes, so um, we were expecting the launch in, uh, in May, um, but we've had some internal delays, as you can imagine, with everything going on. So we're still expecting the product to be launched in the spring of this year. Okay, and then uh, maybe since we are almost out of time, I will uh, raise this concern. It's less about Cepheid, really. It's more about how... Uh, TB programs that might start doing SARS-CoV testing on the gene expert machines. Um, it would be uh, it would be really tragic if they did it at the cost of running MTB RIF. 
Um, so I think we as a community should advocate for additionality rather than replacement of TB testing. So for example, if there are a certain number of TB tests that need to be done, they should get done. And then all other time, uh, for example, at nights, or we could run SARS COVID testing during the day and TB testing at night, find a way to maximally utilize the machine just don't exactly. stop running MTB RIF. To me, that would be my biggest source of anxiety that uh, TV programs will just completely go flat on MTB RIF testing, which would result in a huge drop in uh, TB diagnosis, MDR diagnosis, and result in a lot of transmission within the households. Um, that would Then we'll have a big backlog of TB with more advanced TB presenting in future. So is that something you folks are worried about or thinking about? No, it oh, certainly sure. is. We certainly, yeah, 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 yeah. We 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 can provide information, uh, you know, about the capacity of these instruments, and and uh, you know, and and like like you were uh, alluding to the the, the creative use of uh, per personnel schedules, so so that these instruments aren't aren't sitting idle. You know, they 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 can they can run twenty four seven if there's somebody there to put cartridges into them. Yes, and we do know there's a fair bit of excess capacity in many of these TB gene expert systems procured. So uh, I think that uh, on that very important clear note, uh, we should um, uh, close this webinar that by all means, explore your existing gene expert systems for SARS-CoV in this crisis. Um, by all means, push harder for more access and affordability and advocate for that. But please, let's not do this at the cost of um, all the TB testing that is already starting to suffer in many countries. And let's definitely not completely take over all TB labs and gene expert systems just for SARS-CoV, because we know many more people are dying of TB than they are dying of SARS-CoV. Um, so um, Michael and David Sena, thank you so much. As you can see from the response, this is a very, very um, important issue for all of us. And I think um, working with you, and if you're open to working with the civil society and other groups around this to put out more of, a, of an FAQ on how to integrate TB and COVID testing, um, anxieties that we have about running out of MTB RIF cartridges, your anxiety that countries might stockpile on MTB RIF, and the other anxiety about not stopping TB testing, and the, the fact that the biology and the symptom course are not the same, so we don't have to necessarily force fit simultaneous testing uh, at the same time. I think these are some of the thoughtful discussions that we as a community must work with you, WHO, GDF, and other groups to just kind of clarify. So even a long FAQ type of a document that we could, uh, as a TB community, work with you, some technical, some access related, would be extremely useful at this stage. Otherwise, so many people wouldn't need to sign on to a webinar, right? Or even for you to reassure us, you to reassure us that you will not make SARS-CoV just for the US population, that you care about the rest of the world. I think that's the kind of reassurance that we are looking mm -hmm. for and the anxiety. So this is a great bi-directional exchange that you know where we're coming from and we know what constraints and issues you're dealing with. So we will uh, take this up with you offline and we also invite people on the webinar, civil so society groups working on TV to actively engage in this and making this um, document available very quickly because there are way too many questions and what we could tackle in this particular one hour session. Absolutely, Mitra, thank you, Madhu. Over to yeah. you. Thank you so much. Thank That's you. a perfect summary. Thank you both very much for excellent presentations. If you both agree, we will make your presentations available to the public. This whole webinar has been recorded. We will upload it in several hours. It will be available online. So anyone who wants to review your points and your valuable presentations, please look at this webinar. At the same time, we will also um, upload the questions that we have and we, as Maru, um, pointed out, we will start answering some of the questions and maybe in collaboration, we'll look at a way of putting the 
questions forward because right now I'm looking at 115 questions just during this webinar and I had already received about 25 before this webinar. So clearly this is a point of anxiety a lot, uh, around a lot of people and I'm very, very pleased that you were able to spend your time and talk to all of us. And thank you, Maru, for moderating uh, today. Um, with that, I would like to close this session, um, wishing everyone a good rest of the day, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, and um, we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. I'm going to launch a little poll for anyone who has um, just a few points of um, uh, feedback for us. Please feel free to fill that out. And with that, thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Thank Thanks. you. Thank Goodbye. you. Thank you, Petra.